Let's once again turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help as we study his word this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come to this your holy word, we recognize that it is perfect and we are not. But may you use your word to revive our souls. Lord, we come to the wisdom of your testimony. We pray that you would make wise us simple people here. Give us wisdom, O Lord, that we might know the truth of your word. Lord, your precepts are are right. May you use them to rejoice our hearts even this morning. That having heard your word, O Lord, it would encourage, it would strengthen, it would accomplish that for which you sent it in the hearts and lives of your people. May you reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching through your word this morning, Heavenly Father, that your purposes would be accomplished, that your glory would be known, that your people would be strengthened, and that Christ would be exalted. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. Now this morning, once again, we turn our attention back to 1 Kings, and we want to especially focus on verses 19 to 21. Last week we saw how the Lord had met Elijah. He first met him in the wilderness after he had left the mountaintop experience and he went into the wilderness and the Lord, it says the angel of the Lord, who I believe is the Lord Jesus Christ, ministered to him, fed him, encouraged him, and then he made a 40-day journey to Mount Horeb, to the mountain of God where God had regularly met with Moses. Now he meets there with Elijah. And Elijah is there and he hears and God calls to him and asks him a question, what are you doing here, Elijah? He gives him his answer. He says, I've been jealous for the Lord, our God. And and he seemed to, to feel like he was the only one left who had been faithful to the Lord. But the Lord reminds him then that the Lord is jealous for his own glory and his own name. And that he had called then Elijah to go and anoint two political leaders, one in the kingdom of Syria named Hazael and the other named Jehu who would be then king in Israel and they would then take the sword of the government and use it to accomplish God's judgment on the nation of Israel and Jehu would bring judgment on the house of Ahab. But then the Lord would let Elijah know that he is not only considering and careful about things that are going on and taking care of those things politically in the life of the nation, but he was also concerned for the nation spiritually, and he himself had been working out his purposes. And so he reminds Elijah that he is not the only one left, but that God had preserved. There were 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Although the judgment of the sword of Jehu and Hazael would come on the nation, there would be 7,000 who would be preserved by the Lord, those who had been faithful to him. And then the Lord says to Elijah that he would like him to go and anoint someone, to anoint this Elisha, who would be a spiritual successor to Elijah, who would take up the prophetic mantle, that when Elijah died, when his day on earth was done, or as we know, when he got taken up into heaven, by the chariot of fire, the purposes of God and the prophetic ministry of the word of God in the nation was not going to die with the man. For God himself is the one who is most concerned about his work. And God was providing then one to whom Elijah could pass the baton. A young man like Paul had passed the baton onto Timothy, or like Joshua had served as an assistant to Moses, so then God was going to provide Elijah with a man who could serve alongside him, assist him at first, and eventually then would be his successor. And I think it's important, and I believe it would have been an encouragement to Elijah to know that he was not going to labor alone any longer, and that once his time was done, there would be someone to carry on his ministry. And so I think it is for us this morning, as we look at this text, I pray that we would be encouraged to know that although we may think about the things that are going on in our country and look around at our land and despair at at so many things that, that are not right, both in the world, in the culture, and inside the church, while we may be concerned, God is on his throne. Canada is still his dominion. He is still accomplishing his purposes, and he is 
more than capable of calling and raising up leaders in our day to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to advance his cause and he is still at work in our world and so I hope as we look at this text and see how God it was called Elisha into the ministry to recognize that God even today is doing the same. And so let's carefully then look at this text from verses 19 to 21 this morning. And I want us, first of all, to notice that the call of God to Elisha was a sovereign call. God was the one who was sovereignly calling Elisha into the ministry. Notice that in our text, the Lord doesn't tell Elijah to go and to put out a sign or an advertisement for a prophet and say, Elijah, I know you're tired now. I know that things aren't going well. Maybe if you put out your shingle outside, maybe someone will volunteer for the task. He didn't put out a help wanted sign for an assistant. No, in the text in verse 16b, we find in chapter 19, God told Elijah specifically in this verse, notice what it says. He says, go and anoint Elisha. This is verse 16, the second half. Go anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, to be prophet in your place. God had sovereignly chosen a man, Elisha, a particular man, from a particular place, Abel Meholah, and for a particular purpose, to be a prophet. God had decided this. He was now calling Elijah to go out and to anoint this man whom God had sovereignly chosen. See, while Elijah was at work, God too was at work. While Elijah was ministering, God too was at work in the heart of this Elisha. He had given him form in his mother's womb. He had worked in his life through his family and through others. He had equipped him. He had prepared him for the ministry that he was now going to take part in. Elisha was going to succeed Elisha, but Elijah was then to call him into service. For God, as Ephesians 2.10 says, had prepared works for Elisha in advance for him to do, and now it was time for him to change from the one occupation and to come into another. And so the sovereign calling of God then comes on those who he has prepared to serve him. And this call, this sovereign calling of God for those who would serve and minister to his people is regularly seen throughout the biblical history. That this is not something that man takes on himself, but this is something that is conferred on him by God. We notice, for instance, in Moses. How did Moses come to be the leader of the nation of Israel? Well, you will remember back in Exodus in chapter 3 and verse 10 at the burning bush, the Lord appeared to him at Horeb, at the mountain of God, the very place where now he had appeared to Elijah. And in chapter 3 of Exodus in verse 10, God says this to Moses. He says, come, Moses, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses didn't volunteer. He was called. He was called into service by God himself. You may think about David. Out of all the sons of his father, he was the only one when Samuel had come to anoint someone king that they thought for sure he wasn't the one. He was still out in the field serving and taking care of his father's flocks when they went through one son after another and and Samuel said, none of these are the one whom God has chosen and called. And in 1 Samuel 16, 1, the Lord says this to Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. I have provided for myself. God had provided. He knew the one who he had called and he called him through Samuel. Maybe consider the the calling of the prophet Jeremiah. I believe that even now, God may be forming someone in one of the wombs here in our church or elsewhere to call into the ministry to be a mighty man of God, to proclaim his word and call the country of Canada back to himself. Why would I believe that? Well, Jeremiah 1.5 speaks of the calling of Jeremiah this way. God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. 
Here is writ large the sovereignty of God over the call of Jeremiah. I formed you, I knew you, I consecrated you, I appointed you to be prophet to the nations. You think of the apostles, the 12 apostles. How did they come to be apostles? They thought, you know, Jesus is a fairly good guy. I think we should go and follow him and maybe we'll get put in a position where we could be called apostles someday. No, Jesus says to them in John 15, 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. This has always been the way of God. God loves his people. God cares for his people. And he's the one who, who in the womb knits together and raises up and consecrates and appoints those who would serve his people in this way. It's even the case with elders in the local church. Now you might say, well, how would that be? Well, you remember the words of the Apostle Paul to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 where Paul calls them to pay careful attention to themselves and to all the flock, and then he says, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And you might ask, well, how did the Holy Spirit make them overseers? Did they hear a gentle whisper maybe and they knew that they were supposed to be overseers? How did that happen exactly? Well, what we find is the Holy Spirit makes a man an overseer, I believe, this way. First, he takes a man and he regenerates and gives them a new heart. Secondly, then, the Holy Spirit begins a work of sanctification in the heart of that man. He develops both his character and his aptitude to teach and to understand sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who qualifies the man. And then the Spirit of God places him in a church that will actually heed the Word of God in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3, and the Spirit causes them to take seriously the Word of God so that they're looking around the congregation and would see those whom God the Spirit has qualified by them heeding the qualifications. And then he also places in the heart of that man a desire for the work and then what we find is then he is called to that work and set aside by God to serve as an elder in the local church. And so brothers and sisters, we find then throughout the scriptures and here with Elisha that God is not gonna let his cause fall. The Lord Jesus Christ promised, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If we see a dearth and a lack of godly men like Elisha and Elijah in our day, we need to fall on our knees and call out to the Lord of the harvest to send some more, to take and sovereignly call and, and right from the womb, bring those who would serve his church and proclaim his word. You see, men come and men go, but God remains forever. Elijah's come, Elijah's go. Peter and Paul are no longer with us. Whitfield, Spurgeon, and others have come and gone. As the hymn writer said, frail as summer's flower we perish, we flourish, blows the wind and it is gone. But while mortals rise and perish, God endures unchanging on. One day, I will not be here if the Lord tarries. One day, the other elders that are here in our church will not be here, but Christ will be continuing to shepherd his church, walking among the seven golden lampstands, calling those to his service that his people might be blessed, fed, and encouraged. And so let us call out to him. Let us pray that he would raise up such men in our day as Elijah, Elisha, Peter, Paul, Spurgeon, Whitfield, and others, that he might sovereignly equip them and call them into his service that his church might be grown, blessed, and continue to be built up in our land today. It's interesting, we've been praying for this over and over for the last eight and a half years at our prayer meetings every Wednesday night. And what I find is I'm very, very encouraged that God hears and answers prayer. I find as I look around our land today, there are many men being raised up in the pulpits of our land and in churches, godly pastors and men, as I hear of more and more of them whom God is calling and equipping and they are serving in his church and I find the prophetic voice in our land is once again heard. It seemed like Canadians were very much silent a lot of the time. We were nice people, we were keeping out of the way but during COVID and other things we found that there were voices that were raised up that were proclaiming the truth of God in a prophetic way again in our land. 
And so I'm encouraged, and let's continue then to get on our knees and ask the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into his harvest field like Elisha, that he might sovereignly call them as they, he called Elisha here. And so we see, first of all, that this call of Elisha was a sovereign call of God. Secondly, we see that God calls laborers who are already faithfully working. God calls laborers who are already faithfully working. What do I mean? Well, look at verse 19. It says, So he, Elijah, departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. So when Elijah comes to find Elisha, he doesn't find him up on a mountaintop, sitting there and, and praying and saying, Oh God, I'd like to do something. I want to, to serve you in the ministry, but please help me to know what I am to do with my life sitting there waiting for a word from God. No, Elisha was working. He was doing what was right in front of him at the time. He was plowing, he was not idling, he was laboring, he was not lazing about. Proverbs 20 verse four says, the sluggard does not plow in the autumn, he will seek at harvest and have nothing. Elisha was no sluggard, he was a hard worker, he labored. And we see then here and throughout the scriptures that God sovereignly calls servants who are already serving. He calls laborers who are already laboring in his harvest field. There's a pattern of this. You remember when Moses was called, what was he doing? He wasn't just sitting around somewhere. He was actually shepherding his father-in-law's sheep. We see the same with David when he was called. He was working about the business that God had prepared for him. Andrew, Peter, James, and John were busy laboring in their father's fishing business when Christ called them to fish for men. Matthew was at his tax booth. He was gathering taxes when the Lord called him to come and gather a harvest of souls and to be one of his apostles. And I can tell you that as I look through the scriptures and I look through church history, what I do not find is examples of God calling slothful or lazy individuals to work and to minister for him. It has been said it's far easier to steer and to turn a moving ship than it is to turn one that is stationary. And so let us not be those kind of people who sit around and, and wait and say, I'm just waiting for a call from God. Elisha's call was not one then who came to one who was idle. It was a call for one who was already busy working to continue working just in a different type of labor. He was called from plowing and planting seed in the ground and in the soil to the ministry of plowing and planting the seed of the word of God in the life of the nation and the hearts of men. Now it's interesting too to note here that, that Elisha was not a man who was prepared for this prophetic ministry in an ivory tower of academia. What we find is Elisha was a blue collar man. He was a man with calluses on his hands. He was a farmer. Now, in pointing this out, I'm not in any way diminishing scholarship or learning or academia for the Lord, for instance, ordained that Moses would spend many years in the palace of Pharaoh, in his home, in the courts of Pharaoh, being taught to think, to lead, to write in the courts of Pharaoh, or the Apostle Paul had the highest of educations under Gamaliel as he was taught, and, and so, in these kind of things. So God can use that, and, and regularly does. Men must be trained in the word of God, absolutely. But what I am saying is that we must never give in to the temptation to exalt academia and these kind of things above things like manual labor. The same Moses who spent time in the halls of Pharaoh being educated also spent 40 years in the wilderness caring for his father-in-law's flocks, and both of those were used by God to prepare him for his calling. At least four of the 12 apostles were fishermen before they fished for men. And the greatest example of all, our Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but the majority of our Lord's adult life was spent doing manual labor in a carpenter's shop. And this is absolutely important because our Lord Jesus Christ lived an absolute perfect life to the glory of God. While he was making furniture, while he was shaping wood, 
Well, he was delivering it to a place where people could use it. He was serving and loving his neighbor and serving his family, providing for his family. Brothers and sisters, never demean the call of God to physical manual labor, to regular everyday employments. All of it is ministry. All of it is worship. All of it is a calling and a vocation unto the glory of God. Elisha was serving God while he was plowing a straight furrow with his oxen, and he would go to serve God while he was plowing the soil of men's hearts to plant the seed of his word. These things are are necessary. They are good. They are blessed, and they are meant to be done to the glory of God. And I'm afraid today that many in modern evangelicalism have lost the ground that was recovered by our forefathers at the time of the Protestant Reformation. And we have lost in our country what we used to call the Protestant work ethic. The Protestant work ethic. People don't know how to work today because they don't know and believe in God today. And those who do believe in God somehow think that the work that they do in manual labor is somehow much less. And so someone that is faithfully cutting meat over here thinks he's not doing something unless he's evangelizing to the person standing next to him. Now, we, we, all we can evangelize our co-workers at lunchtime and other things. I believe that while we're cutting meat, we should be cutting meat. That while we are doing this, we do it to the glory of God. This is our vocation. This is what God has called us to. Martin Luther said this about vocation. He said, every occupation has its own honor before God. Every occupation. He says, ordinary work is a divine vocation or calling. In our daily work, no matter how important or mundane, we serve God by serving our neighbor. And we also participate in God's ongoing providence for the human race. This is so important that we understand this. You don't go to work just to make money. You do you go to work for the glory and worship of Christ and for love of neighbor and to work alongside of God in his ongoing providence in providing for others. I'm so thankful that this morning when our air conditioning unit was entirely down that someone came here and actually could fix it and not just exegete the scriptures. We need these people. We must once again then lay hold of the idea that everything we do, whether in the home, the community, at work, in the church, is to be done wholeheartedly as worship to the Lord. We must take hold of the words of the Apostle Paul to the Colossian church in 3 and verse 23 where he exhorts the Christians saying, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. Be a carpenter to the glory of Christ. Be a housewife to the glory of Christ. Work in the mind to the glory of Christ. Don't just think, well, I'm doing my work to get a paycheck so I can go home and do the things I really want to do. Christ has called you to glorify him, to work. And Elisha then had a Protestant work ethic long before the moniker came into vogue. He was found by Elijah working hard for the Lord, plowing his field. Then he was called to labor for the Lord in a different type of field, both to the glory of God. And so I encourage you, even this week, to put your hand to whatever plow God has before you. And he will ensure that if he has other work for you to do for him, that he will let us know when the time is right. And this is what we find with Elisha. He diligently worked at what he had to do, and then the Lord said, now it's time for you to do something else. You've been faithful in these things. Now I'm going to call you into the ministry. And so God sovereignly calls, and he calls those who are already laboring. Thirdly, we notice then, I want us to see Elisha's response to this call of God. Beginning at verse 19, it says, So he, Elijah, departed from there, found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him. He was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him, cast his cloak upon him, and then it says, And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And then it says, And he returned from following him. Notice what he does. He took the yoke of oxen, sacrificed them, boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen, gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. Now notice when Elijah arrived he didn't, it doesn't seem to me that he said anything to Elisha. He just in, instead performed a very significant act. 
The text says at the latter half of verse 19, Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And it seems then that after doing this, Elijah just continued to walk on. For the text says, Elisha left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said. And notice too that Elisha didn't have to ask, well, what in the world does this mean? Why are you throwing your cloak on me like this? No, Elisha understood the significance, the weighty significance of the act, that this was symbolic of a passing of the torch, so to speak, of a passing of the prophetic mantle and placing it from Elijah on to Elisha, that he was now being called to serve as a prophet of God, to leave the comforts of home and to take up the honorable and yet difficult life of a prophet. As I was thinking about this, it's interesting that it is really a a difficult thing to guide a yoke of oxen in a straight line. But there's a reason why we use the phrase, he is stubborn as an ox. At the same time, to labor to direct the stubborn hearts of the Israelite nation in the path, in the narrow path that they were to go was quite another thing, and Elijah could attest to its even greater difficulty. And so he has been called. He has received the mantle. What does he do? Well, we see that he responds promptly to the call of God. Immediately, if you will, the text says that he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Elisha doesn't hesitate. He responds immediately to the call of God. He leaves the oxen, runs after Elijah, and then says to him, let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? Now, we may, in hearing Elisha say this, let me go and kiss my father and mother, might remember another text in the New Testament where someone was called by the Lord Jesus Christ to follow him who said, let me first go and bury my father. And you might be thinking, okay, and then the Lord Jesus Christ didn't necessarily say, okay, that's a good thing. Now, what is the difference here? What is the difference between maybe what Elisha has said and what this man has said? Now, Elisha here, I believe, is in essence saying, let me go and say goodbye. Let me go and say goodbye. Let me embrace my parents before I go, and then I will immediately follow you. He wanted to honor his parents and let them know and kiss them and then move on and take on this prophetic office. But the man who had said, let me first go and bury my father, I believe was saying far more. He was seeking to put off the call of Christ for an indefinite period of time until his father had died. I don't believe that his father had yet died. John Calvin, in commenting on this, said it is probable that his father was in extreme old age for the mode of expression here, permit me to bury him, implies that he had but a short time to live. Many other commentators say the same. The man's father was still alive but old, and he was saying, well, when my father dies and I can take care of that, then I will follow you. Very different than Elisha saying, I'm coming after you. I'm just going to go home and embrace my parents, and then I'll be right back. And so Elisha promptly obeys the call of God. Elisha exemplifies the one who understood what Christ says in Matthew 10, 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He was willing to leave his home, leave his father, leave his mother, leave his occupation. Elisha not only responded promptly, but he made a decisive break with his past. Elisha wasn't a man with one foot in each camp kind of said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll follow the Lord and I'll do this, but I'm also going to hedge my bets and I'll keep another foot over here. No, in verse 21, notice what he did. He returned from following him and then he takes the yoke of oxen, what he was working with, his livelihood. He sacrifices them, boils their flesh with the yokes of the oxen, gives it to the people and they ate. So you're not getting the oxen back. The oxen aren't coming back. The people have eaten them. They are gone. And then it says, then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. Now, this is a radical step. He takes decisive action. We might say that Elisha burned his bridges behind him. That having put his hand to a very different plow, he wasn't going to look back. He had decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Here we might be reminded of the call of Abraham where he was called to leave his father and mother in his homeland and go to the place that God would show him. Abraham was called to leave, to make a decisive break with the past. It says that Abraham, after he was called, left and went and followed the Lord. 
You might also be reminded of the account of the Lord Jesus Christ and his calling of James and John in Mark 1, 19 and 20, where it says, and going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and the hired servants and followed him. They left all and they followed him immediately. Or maybe in the call of Elisha here, it might remind us of the time when we were called with a different kind of call. A call when the Lord Jesus Christ called us to come and follow him, to become a disciple of him, when he called us out of the world to become part of his people. When he called us to repent of our old way of life and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to turn from a life of sin and come and follow him, being one of his disciples. No one comes to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe on him, to be one of his disciples who has not made a decisive break with the past and then is called to walk in newness of life. Jesus said in Mark 8, 34, if anyone would come after me, that's a very, very broad statement. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And I want to ask you this morning, if you are here, have you heard the call of Christ? Has the Spirit of God been calling you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to follow him, to be one of his disciples? And have you made a decisive break with your past? Have you left your old ways of living behind and dedicated yourself wholly to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you still trying to keep one foot in your old life? I'll keep doing these things and I'll go to church. I'll keep doing these things and maybe I can have Christ too. I'll hedge my bets. I'll enjoy my life now in the world. I'll eat and drink for tomorrow I die. And at the same time, I'll try to believe a little bit on Christ just in case there's something true here about him. Jesus Christ will not allow you to just add him as another piece of your life. Jesus Christ is king. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He is God. He is not a genie to kind of have along your side in case you need him for something along the way. He wants all or nothing. He wants your life, your soul, your all. And when you truly see and hear the call of God and you see the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ, all those other things won't matter. You'll say, I will turn my back away from this. I'm gonna follow Christ. He's the one in whom is eternal life. He's the one who is Lord and God. He made me. He came to save me. He will sanctify me and he will take me home to glory. All these other things, I turn aside. I make a decisive break. I'm going to follow Christ. No matter what the world says, no matter what my parents say, no matter what anybody says, Christ is my all and I will follow him. The one who hears and truly hears the crawl of Christ will be able to sing with the hymn writer, take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to thee. Take every one of my moments and my days. May they all flow in endless praise. Oh God, take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thy, thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Oh, take my love, my Lord, I pour. At thy feet its treasures store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. For much of my life I worshipped my body. I worshipped recreation. I worshipped athletics. I worshipped a lot of things, but I didn't worship and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he came to me and he called me, he humbled me under his mighty hand, showed me my sin, showed me his greatness, said, come and follow me. I made a decisive break with the past. It wasn't long before all of these things became as nothing compared to the glories of knowing and following the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Have you come to follow him? Are you willing to burn your bridges behind you and say, it's, it's all of Christ, I follow him? The late J.R. Macduff, in commenting on this call of Elisha, says the following. He says, what a lesson for us 
this abnegation of self for God and duty. He says, what have we surrendered of our worldly ease, our pleasures, our money, our children, our advantages for him and for his cause? He says, let oxen, implements, tacking, and all go and perish in the flames if they rob our hearts of Christ or Christ of our hearts. He said, Matthew locked the door of his toll house behind him and followed Christ. The magicians in Ephesus burned their books that they might no more incur the risk of being involved in all their sorceries. Burn it behind you and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him to take you, to save you, and give you a heart that would follow him for all eternity. This is the call of God on each one who comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, let us seek the Holy Spirit's help as we seek to live in this way. So often the Israelites longed to go back to Egypt. That they looked back and thought of all the things they had left behind, how good it was. They forgot the slavery. They forgot the bondage. May we not look back, but may we look forward, pressing on, as the Apostle Paul says, to what is, he says, leaving what is behind, I press on toward the upward call of God that is in Christ Jesus for us. Finally, then, I want us to notice that this call, it was a sovereign call of God to a working man of God, which he responded to promptly and decisively. Finally, we see here, it was a call to service and a call to discipleship. Look at the end of verse 21. It says, then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. It was first a call to service. He was called to serve alongside, to serve under Elijah to come under this great prophet of God who had served for so long and to come alongside him and to be his assistant. Like Joshua was for so long at the side of Moses, like a Timothy along the side of Paul, like the disciples who walked for three years with Christ, serving, apprenticing, being discipled as they did this. It was a call to discipleship. Elisha wasn't then going right from this point in time to the top of Mount Carmel that he might be exalted before the nation. First, he must take on the towel and learn to serve, to learn to assist, to take the lesser role. He was there to serve another faithful man of God, to serve alongside him. Like Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, Elijah was called to take what he had learned and entrust it to another faithful man, Elisha, who would be able to teach others also. This is the call to make disciples, to disciple them. Elisha would be a great encouragement, I believe, to Elijah. Elijah was tired. Elijah was weary. Elijah had done a lot in his lifetime. He was in the twilight of his ministry. He would have a number of years left, but he would not have to do it alone. He would no longer have to go by the brook Cherith alone. He would not have to go and journey to Zarephath and be without spiritual fellowship. He would have Elisha there with him, serving alongside him. And then when Elijah's work was done, he also knew that the work of the Lord would continue. The Lord already knew this, but now he knew. He knew there would be someone he could pass the baton to who would carry on the torch after he was whisked off into heaven, into glory in a chariot of fire. And let me ask you as I close, if you have heard the call of Christ and you are following him, let me ask you this morning, are you discipling another? Are you busy in ministry in the church but not passing the baton to the next generation? Have you brought alongside others alongside of you? Some of you have great gifts of hospitality. Are, are you helping others to understand what you are doing and to share that gift so that they can grow in it with them? Some of you are great. You keep care of the church property and other things. Will there be someone left who knows something of the sprinkler system when you are gone? Someone who knows how to flick the little switch so that the air conditioning will come on? These things are practical. Are there others that you're a teacher? Are you passing the torch along, bringing alongside other young men and others around you that can then do this? Are the older women teaching the younger women so that there will be godly homes one day when you are gone to be with the Lord? It won't be, oh, we so love that person and they were so great at the time, but there's no one left to carry the torch. God sovereignly works, but he calls us to our responsibility. And so I pray that we would be not only discipling others, but that we would find others to be discipled by. 
to walk alongside them, to assist them. If you are a younger person or others in our, in our midst, you've just come to faith in Christ, find someone who is godly, someone you can follow after, someone you can work alongside and assist in their ministry that God might use them to build you up in this and prepare you for the work so that you will carry on the torch. And so this morning then we see, I think as Elijah saw, that the work of the Lord is in good hands. People have said you're in good hands with all state. I don't think they're the ones that are the ones that we should put our trust in. You are in great hands because the sovereign Lord of the church and the sovereign Lord of his people, the Lord Jesus Christ, has all authority in heaven and on earth. He has promised to build his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. He is right now preparing those who he will sovereignly call to serve him when many of us are gone. Unless the Lord returns, we count on the fact that he will continue to do this, and yet we want to be those who are diligently laboring for his cause, those who regularly are discipling others to take our place. May God help us as we seek to not only hear his word, but to be doers and appliers of it in the week ahead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a wonder it is that you have given us a perfect word a perfect word from God. Oh, Lord, we thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It is an encouragement to our hearts. And we pray that each one of us who are here today would, would go away with a great sense of, of confidence in you, in what you are doing to accomplish your purposes in our land and in your people. And at the same time, O oh Lord, may it spur us on that we might follow you, that we might labor for you, that we might promptly obey you, that, Lord, that we would turn away from the things of the past and that we would look forward to the things that are ahead, that we would follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And if there are some here this morning who are still lingering like Lot did in, in Sodom, still, O oh Lord, under your judgment, still, Lord, if they would pass away today, would not know the Lord Jesus Christ, would not have followed him. O oh Lord, convict their hearts even now. Help them to see that all of the world is nothing compared to the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Draw them to yourself. Only you, Holy Spirit of God, can truly effectually call someone to the Lord Jesus Christ. May you work in hearts even today that some might say it was that day that I heard the call of God and he gave me strength to believe, to repent, and to follow after Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.